Uh, have you noticed there aren't as many wow moments out there in the world anymore? Um, the beginning of, beginnings of the early Seventh-day Adventist movement. Gentleman went up to somebody and said, Show me, tell me who the most honest man in town is. Found who the most honest, had the man with the reputation of the most honest person in town, went up to him, looked him right in the face, and said, What's the news? And the news is the seventh day is the Sabbath. Wow, stunning. Whoa. You go back a little bit farther, you go back to the book of Acts. You go back to Acts chapter 2. And what was it that was, it was another one of those wow moments. What was the wow moment? Looking at folks that had come together for a special Jewish feast. And the wow moment was, well, he, we are standing around here feasting. There is somebody who is that Messiah that the Old Testament was speaking about. And we put him on a cross. Woo! Talk about a wow moment. I wonder sometimes if the world isn't constantly looking for the next wow moment and just struggling along in wow this or wow that or wow the other. And could I suggest, it is my belief, that for the most part, yes, there are a few wow moments, but there are very few. Could I suggest today we think a little less about the wow moments and a little more about the basics of give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Would you take your Bible with me? Look at something with me. Turn to the book of Romans, if you would. Romans chapter 1. You can do this with every one of Paul's epistles that are in the New Testament. Every one of them, frankly. Every one of Paul's epistles. Notice the way he starts. Paul, a servant of who? Jesus Christ. But let's say it a little different than that. When he says Jesus Christ, he is making an assumption. He is saying when an apostle of Jesus who is the Christ. Remember again that word Christ is Greek. It is the exact same word that in Hebrew is Messiah. He is saying Jesus Messiah. He is saying this man, that Jesus of Nazareth, is the Messiah that the scripture was talking about. That's the issue in which he says I want to talk about. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus, who is the Christ. That is the issue. That is the issue that Paul talks about all the time. You can wander through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians, Colossians, he always starts with an apostle of Jesus who is the Christ. And you get in a few verses in, and before he gets going into his message itself, he says, and grace and peace to you from Jesus, from our God and Father, and Jesus the Christ. You see, folks, we can talk about everything all, all we want to. We can talk about messages. We can talk about doctrines. We can talk about everything else. But the issue of Christianity comes down to one thing. Is Jesus the Christ of the Scriptures? Or isn't he? That's it. That's it. Is Jesus the Christ? We can argue authorship till the cows come home. That's not my issue here. But would you turn to the book of Hebrews? Hebrews and watch the story of Hebrews now again 
in Hebrews, we can get all tangled up looking at the different details of this or that or the other. We can get into a great argument in Hebrews chapter 8, chapter 9, and chapter 10 about what the sanctuary configuration is or where the pieces of furniture belong or don't. We can argue that stuff something greatly. I would suggest, though, if we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, I would ask you to go home this afternoon and just give it a read. Just give it a read and see what the flavor is of the general overview. And I would suggest the overview of Hebrews comes down to one thing, and it comes back over and over and over and over and over again. And it is, Jesus is better than. Jesus is better than. Hebrews chapter 1, God who in various times and different ways spoke in times past, to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Verse 4, having become so much better than the angels. Whoops. Jesus is better than the angels. Why? Because of inheritance. He is above. You get... Watch chapter 1, he talks about because Jesus is God. You get into chapter 2, and he says Jesus is stronger than the angels because Jesus is also a part of humanity. You get into chapter 3, and he gets into something else. Now, by the way, who is, to our Jewish friends, who is the greatest of the prophets to our Jewish friends? Who would that be? I'll give you a little hint. Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Who's the greatest of the prophets to our friends, our Jewish friends? It is Moses. Hebrews chapter 3, Jesus is greater, better prophet than Moses. Why? He says very simply, Jesus is a greater prophet than Moses because Moses did the job that he was asked to do. He's the created being who was asked to do, and he did it and did it faithfully. But Jesus is above because he's the one that did the... He's the one that made Moses. He's above. You get moving on further. You get into the end of chapter 4, and it says Jesus is a greater high priest. You get into chapter 5, he gets explaining that. The greater high priest because Jesus is higher than Levi. Hmm. Notice, if you will, when it comes right down to it, the issue is bigger than all the details. The thing comes down to, put it in its nub, is Jesus the Messiah of the Old Testament or not? Simple fact. The historians will tell us today. The historians will tell us it is better, if it comes down to writing the history of very famous people, wait until they've been around about 50 years. Wait until about 50 years afterwards. If you're going to write a good history, on a, a good biographical history on a president, somebody that is the president, wait until they've been off the scene for about 50 years because you get rid of the fuzziness and the extras and the fancy stuff that gets in there, the fancy schmancy stuff that doesn't really amount to much, and you get to the nub of the issue. For instance, how many of you have heard of George Washington? Okay, yeah, heard of George Washington, father of the country, the United States, yeah. How many of you have heard about George Washington and the cherry tree? You heard the story about George Washington and the cherry tree? You know, George Washington, the gentleman who was, even as a small boy, Okay, he did something bad, he cut down the cherry tree, but uh, when his dad confronted him with the issue, did you cut down the cherry tree? The answer was, yes, I did, and because of that, his, you, know, you know the story. He, because of his honesty, his dad wouldn't... Punish, which reminds me, this being October, uh, have you heard the Halloween story about George Washington and the cherry tree? When my dad was in his teen years, you get back to the early middle section of the 20th century in the United States of America, Halloween was a time for turning over outdoor toilets. Okay? Young folks liked to do that to the farmers around. You know, go, that was the yolly thing to do during Halloween was to tip over the 
the outhouse. And the story goes of this fine, upstanding young man who thought that would be a great prank, and he turned over to the outhouse. And uh, Dad was not happy. And Dad grabbed all of the boys, there were a bunch of boys, grabbed them all, lined them up right in front of one in front of each other, and said, all right, now, which one of you guys turned over the outhouse? Nobody said a word. Dad threatened, Dad screamed, Dad yelled. He was going to do this, he was going to do that, he was going to do the other. Which one of you did it? Nobody said a word. Dad changed tactics. Told the story of George Washington and the cherry tree. Told about how George in, in, in the cherry tree uh, cut down the cherry tree and that his dad confronted him with it and George was so honest he could not tell a lie. He said he did it. And because of that, his dad made a special point not to punish him because of his honesty of actually come up forward, you know, confessing that he did it, telling the truth. His dad did not punish him. Now, which one of you turned over the outhouse? And you know, the, story, the, the, the cherry tree story worked. The young man raised his hand. He said, dad, it was me. Whereupon his dad jumped on him, grabbed him, and proceeded to wail the tar out of him. And between yipes and yowls and howls and tears, the young man was saying, But Dad, you told the story of George Washington and the cherry tree, and but you know, coming true, honest and not, to which Dad said, That's true. But I doubt if George's dad was in the cherry tree when George cut it down. <laughs> the cherry tree story. There is nothing documented in history of it ever being. It was one of those stories that came to bigger than life. It has no fact to it. It is strictly a made-up story. We can get so excited about strange wild stories it's better to back up a little bit and let's watch and listen and let fact and fiction gonna kind of get sorted out from one another notice if you will the book of Hebrews probably written in the 60s 30 years after the time of Jesus we can talk about this detail and that detail or what happened or what didn't, but let's come back to Jesus as the Son of God. That makes him higher than the angels, better than the angels. That makes him higher than Moses. That makes him a better covenant than the covenant. That makes him better than the sanctuary. Who? You want a wild one? Look at Hebrews 1 again, the first couple of verses. Watch this. God, who at various times in different ways spoken times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, through, also, through whom also he made the worlds. Now switch over and follow, look at chapter 9. Verse 28. So Christ was offered once to bear the sin of many, to those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. So just the first phrase there. Christ was offered once to bear the sin of many. Now will you watch something else? Take your Bible. Turn over to the last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. Keeping your finger there, what does it say? We worship God the Father as creator. Didn't it say that in chapter 1? First three verses. And we worship the Son 
as the Redeemer, the one who became sin for us, right? Notice Revelation. Watch what Revelation says. Pick up Revelation chapter 4 and chapter 5, the throne room scene in heaven. Throne room scene in heaven. Watch what chapter 4 says. Chapter 4 talks about the four living creatures, the 20 worlds. I'm not going to go into that. Watch what the whole four living creatures do. Verse 8. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around within, and they knew not rest day and night. And what do they sing? Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor, uh, the, the 24 elders call down before, and what do they sing? Verse 11, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory, honor, and power, for you created all things, and by you they exist. And in chapter 5, why do we worship the one? Why do they cast their crowns before the Son, the one sitting with the Father on the throne? It is, you are worthy, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain. Same message. You want another wild, comical one? Anybody here? It goes back a few years. I don't know that it's even that big a deal anymore. And it's certainly, certainly out of my league because I'm not into the uh, real, I, I didn't grow up with money and in the real special crowds but you go back and watch the newspapers even back this end uh, mid 20th century anybody ever heard of a debutante ball you know what that is the debutante ball was the special occasion where there was the family would hold this special reception where the young lady was kind of her, this is a young woman that is time to be dating, etc. The debutante ball. And she would be brought down and, and this special event. Would you go back to Revelation chapter 1? Look at the verse verse. the revelation of Jesus Christ. John is an old man when he writes Revelation. He is one of the very last of the people that have actually seen Jesus. He says, let me introduce to you Jesus the Christ. Jesus who is the Christ. Let me introduce to you this Jesus who is the Christ. You go back to Hebrews. After we get the better, 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 Jesus is better than this, better than that, better than the other, you come to chapter 11. Chapter 11 is the faith chapter. For by faith we believe. By faith Abraham. By faith uh, Isaac, by faith this one, by faith that one, by faith the other one. And I would suggest to you that too is not the point. The point is chapter 12. Watch what it says in chapter 12. Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run the race with endurance that is set before us, how? Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The issue in Christianity is Jesus. It is not this one, it is not that one, it is not all those that have come before. It is Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. We can talk all we want about this one or that one or the other. We can talk all we want about doctrinal this or that or the other. The issue comes back to Jesus. Is Jesus the Messiah 
of the scriptures or not. If he is, follow him. But notice, if you will, if I can put it in big, fancy, $10 theological words, justification always comes before sanctification. Jesus first, then follow him. Don't get in the discussion about follow or do this or do that or don't do that or this or that or the other. It is Jesus first. Because of who he is, follow him. Jesus first. All the other stuff will take care of itself. Jesus first. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. I've been leading you through this congregation through doctrinal. What do we believe on the different subjects? It seems like once in a while we might remember to back up and just say, why don't we get back to what is the subject of our conversation? And the answer is, Jesus, follow him. Is Jesus the Messiah of Scripture? Is Jesus the Christ? We buzz through that so fast we forget. When, when Paul is saying, Jesus Christ, he is saying, I am talking about this guy named Jesus who is the Messiah of the Scriptures. That's it. This Jesus. Follow him. It's the only thing that matters. This Jesus. Follow him. This same Jesus. This give me Jesus. We can talk about everybody else. But give me Jesus. If he is not the Messiah, maybe we better be looking for somebody else. If he is not the Messiah, maybe we better be looking for another one. If he is the Messiah, is he worth following? Turn back to words of Jesus for a few minutes. Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus answers the question of the disciples. The disciples ask him a question. Actually, they ask him two questions. They think they're only asking him one question. The question is, when will all these things happen in Jerusalem, and what will be the signs of your coming? They think they're asking him one question. He goes into answering the question. Watch him answer the question. He talks about the things in Jerusalem. Things will get pretty bad. Things will get kind of uncomfortable. Things are going to get bad for the, for the Jewish people. Uh, Hebrews comes right out and tells us, it says, and we're about to the time when the sanctuary will completely be destroyed. He's, Jesus is talking about this in Matthew 24. All these things are going to happen. Then he says something strange. Notice verse 20. One and onward. Chapter 24. There will be great tribulation such as has not been seen since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then, if anyone says to you, look here, here is the Christ, or there, don't believe it. False Christs and false prophets will arise and show great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even the very elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if, you, if you, they say to you, look, he is in the desert, do not go. Or look, he is in the inner room, don't believe it. 
Well, then he goes on to talk about second coming language. And Jesus will come in the clouds of glory, etc. But notice that in between. Don't get all excited about every time somebody comes running along and screams, I've got a new wow moment for you. Wow, what about this or what about that or what about that? Don't get all excited about all that kind of stuff. Wows will come and go, but they won't be any big deal. Don't get excited about that. Keep your eye on the mark. I remember once sitting in my office, minding my own business in another church, when somebody came wandering in all excited. Oh, they were all fired up. Pastor, did you know such and such? I'd never heard of such and such. Did you know this person? Have you been? Uh, and, and I didn't know. He said, well, don't you keep up with your internet? I said, probably not as much as you do. Why? What are you asking about? Oh, you need to know. There's a church someplace, somewhere over here, such and such, and, and there's a guy in that church that's a prophet, and we need to declare that this guy is a prophet. I said, no, we don't. Oh, he was upset with me. What do you mean, no, we don't? We need to declare. We need to be search this out and decide if this guy is a prophet or if he's not. And I said, no, we don't. But pastor, this is potentially big. This guy is, is a prophet. And, and the ones that get on, I said, eh, let's just sit back and watch and wait and see what happens. No, pastor, this guy is a prophet. We've got to get on this. I said, eh, not me. Well, as a few weeks later, I get another guy coming grabbing me. Pastor, have you heard? I said, no, I've only heard of that one. Yeah, well, this guy is a prophet. He is making tremendous messages for God. And, and this guy is the guy. Uh, I said, well, we'll watch and we'll listen and whatever. Oh, they were mad at me. About a year later, I just happened to ask those guys, by the way, whatever happened to your prophet guy? Oh, I don't want to talk about that. I said, why not? Come to find out he was a false prophet. I said, okay. What's the big deal? But have you guys learned anything? They said, what do you mean? Don't be in a hurry to have to be the first ones to decide whether somebody is or isn't. Sit back and wait a little bit. Don't get all excited about this prophet or this, this, or this, this, or that, this other thing, or whatever. Sit back and wait. Keep your eye on Jesus, and the rest of us just kind of, the rest of it just kind of sit and wait. Oh, that's not so exciting. Could I tell you that's exactly what Jesus said? There's going to be new Christs and new Messiahs and new this and new that. Keep your eye on Jesus and let the rest of it come and go. That isn't it. Could I try you another one? Would you go back to Revelation? The revelation of Jesus who is the Christ. And it talks about the revelation of Jesus. And it talks about the promise that the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit are right there working together. And then we get off into things where you can get lost pretty easily in Revelation. We can get into all sorts of fighting and scrapping and hobbling about the trumpets, the seals, the historical stuff that's going to happen between the first coming of Jesus and the second coming of Jesus. But notice to keep your eye on in Revelation. Revelation concludes with, it crescendos to the second coming, and then the millennium, and then the earth made new. In between is all that stuff of living in a sinful world. What did Jesus say in Matthew 24? Remember that Jesus is the Christ. Keep your eye on that. There's going to be a bunch of people that are going to come about and get all excited about this and all excited about that and all excited about the other thing and always here and always there and always this. Let it go. But keep your eye on Jesus. If Jesus is the Messiah, follow him. That is not in any way, shape, or form to downgrade the importance of following Jesus. But remember, justification comes before sanctification. Keep your eye on Jesus. If he is the Messiah, follow him. There, the Christian gospel is Jesus. 
Keep your eye on Jesus. The purpose of what a Christian is, is very simple. Follow Jesus. Amen? Keep your eye on Jesus. Don't have to be the first one to figure out something else. Keep your eye on Jesus. Follow him, and it'll be okay. Do we believe that? Do we believe we follow Jesus? It is so frustratingly basic. Paul, an apostle of Jesus, who is the Christ. Could I say it this way? If anybody could give any compliment, I would ask for the compliment to be this. Jim, who is a disciple of Jesus, who is the Christ. Well, that'd be a pretty good thing for each of us to, by name, be known as a disciple of Jesus, who is the Christ. That's it. Heavenly Father. We thank you for teaching us so many things that help us to remember first and foremost to keep our eyes on Jesus. We thank you for sending Jesus to be the Christ, to be the Messiah. We thank you that he came right on time. We thank you that he came just the way the scripture said he would. We thank you that Jesus is the Son of God, and we thank you that he is the humanly the Son of David. We thank you that Jesus lived. We thank you that he died. We thank you that he is resurrected. We thank you that he has the keys to the grave. Help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. We thank you that Jesus is our Lord of Lords. We thank you that he has given us the scriptures to share with us how to live in a way that's in our best interest. But help us to keep our eyes on Jesus. May we see Jesus is our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.